Why did you move from Australia? Why did you leave Australia? Why did you leave Australia? Why did you leave Australia? But why, why, why are you here? Amazing there. <laughs> I don't understand. Okay. Isn't Australia so incredible? You guys have everything. You have beaches, nature, poisonous snakes, deadly spider. Okay, maybe I get why you left Australia. When you come to London, of all places. What the hell happened? It's for Australia. Why? 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 This question. If you're an Australian living abroad, take a shot for every time you've been asked this question. I've been asked it from pretty much all of you guys, everyone that I've met at a house party, and even a Canadian border officer while I was getting detained. Well, this is it guys. I'm giving you my answer. Probably a few years too late. I was actually in the Guardian article about this very topic a few years ago, beautifully titled, A Spoilt Brat Country the Australians overseas who decided not to come home. It was about the Australians living overseas during the pandemic and despite all the calls and opportunity to come home before the world shut down, seemingly forever, looked back at home and thought, yeah, nah, I'm good. It went viral. Over half a million views, which is a lot for a news article. It was the top article in the lifestyle section. Link in the description if you want to read it. I got a few messages from coworkers about it. A lot of the views from bitter Australians back home, no doubt. They're not really known for their ability to handle criticism. They dish it out, but they can't take it, really. Just scrolling through the article and... Yep, that's me. That's 2020 me. Oh, what a time. What a time. Before we get into all the reasons, and there's a lot, maybe a bit of backstory about me for context. My name's Lashawn, I'm from Sydney, Australia. Born in Sydney, grew up in Newcastle, went back to Sydney for university. I've been to Melbourne a few times and it's better. I'll admit it. We do have great beaches though. Halfway through my civil engineering with architecture degree, I went on exchange to Montreal, Canada, which completely changed who I was as a person. After the semester abroad, I traveled solo through Europe for three months. I did 46 cities in 20 countries over 89 days, which kickstarted my passion for solo travel, photography, and video. Ever since my exchange and that epic trip, I just knew I had to leave Australia. So I did. As soon as I graduated, I packed my life into two suitcases and a carry-on and moved to Montreal, Canada on a working holiday visa. I learned French in a year and after a total of two and a half years there and a lot of drama at the end, I left for London on another working holiday visa via a three week stint in Paris where I fell in love with the city. After nine months in London came good old March 2020 and yeah, my life fell apart. <laughs> like everyone's did, I'm sure. I was faced with the decision to either quit my job in London that I struggled for six months to even get and throw away my entire life abroad to effectively nothing in Australia, or I stay and brave it through whatever this is, and it was a complete unknown at the time. I chose option two. It was not easy. A lot of job instability coupled with being effectively stateless for over two years, a one-way ticket back home to Australia was over 12,000 pounds, economy class. Do you have 12,000 pounds lying around for an economy class ticket? No? On the bad side. The good side being able to experience a completely deserted London during lockdown, an experience so special that you know in the moment how special it is and that you will never experience anything like it ever again. And finally being able to try out life as a digital nomad. I lived in Paris for five weeks in the summer of 2020, which was incredible because all the Americans were banned from Europe. Portugal for three weeks, Tenerife for a month, and loads of four to five day remote working trips in between. It was amazing. My visa expired in May 2021, and I was on visa extensions due to COVID called Exceptional Assurance for seven months while my company rejected my first attempt to get sponsored by them, which I appreciated, thank you. And in December 2021, finally decided to accept me, getting my sponsored visa in January 2022. I just quit that job and my life in London in April this year. Went to Montreal for the eclipse, lived in Lisbon for a little over two months, and now I'm here back in London, as you can see with the grayness, the gray over there. Obviously I'm in London to do a visa application before I moved to France on a working holiday visa post Olympics. I'm actually here in Wandsworth because I came here to collect my results for the application. And yeah, I got, I got the visa. Holy crap. That might sound like a lot, but I'm amazed that I condensed that to so little. Anyway, I've been living abroad for over seven years now. And even with all the ups and downs that I've experienced, and there's a lot and a lot that I haven't mentioned right now, not even once have I regretted doing this instead of staying home in Australia. And I have no intentions of moving back. Here's why.
tall poppy syndrome. Let's go straight for the artery here. A big reason why I left Australia was the people. Now, just to preface everything I'm about to say in the rest of this video, I'm of course generalizing here and there are genuinely good people in Australia, just like everywhere else. But after living abroad and then coming back, you tend to notice patterns and differences when averaged across the wider populace and everyone you meet. I also think Portuguese people are incredibly kind, but you don't get the same kind of pushback in turn against those positive types of statements. Now do you? There's a reputation Aussies have about being laid back and chill, but it's really just surface level. When you grow up in it, there's a cultural cancer that's holding this country back and it's called tall poppy syndrome. To explain the metaphor, imagine a field of flowers and one of them is growing faster than all the other ones. What do you do to that flower? You cut it. Of course. In Australia, we do that with people. If you have any ambition or desire to do something outside the norm, everyone around you will ostracize you, cast out, bully you, tear you down repeatedly until you give up and do what everybody else is doing. There's a lot of defenders of it in Australia who say it promotes equality, which it does technically, but equality through shared mediocrity. The net effect is everyone strives to be average. Everyone's holding themselves back instead of pushing themselves to their fullest potential. Everyone's pressured to fit in, not stand out. Like we're all still in high school. They tear you down for having big dreams, but if you ignore them and keep going and end up making it, oh yeah, then they'll sell celebrate you and claim you as their own, as if they were there the entire time, once you're established and a safe bet. But no support until you get there. All right, mate. Okay, sure, sure. You want some favors? Oh, you want to be my friend now? Okay, yeah? Is that how it is? You can see it in the complete lack of investment in sectors like the arts or even tech slash startups. You ever wonder why famous Australian actors like Margot Robbie or Chris Hemsworth, etc., etc., all move abroad to the US and UK to kickstart their careers? Because staying in Australia is a dead end for them. The furthest you're gonna get is a lifetime role on Neighbours or getting to be the next racist loudmouth morning show host with inflated ego. Shame that that joke can be applied to multiple people. Anyway, that brings me to my next point, the lack of opportunity. Now, obviously this is totally first world problems, but for industries outside the major ones like healthcare, law, engineering, mining, there's a massive dearth of opportunities in Australia. Even in those industries, there are way more opportunities if you take the leap and move abroad. For example, I used to work in the civil engineering industry and my job in Sydney was for a big multinational civil engineering firm where I got to work on a section of the Pacific Highway where we upgraded it from single carriageway to dual carriageway, from one lane each way to two lanes each way. My first job in engineering in London was upgrading Heathrow Terminal 5 only the most famous airport in the world. These are absolutely worlds apart. And all the big name projects that you could work on, for example, HS2, Sagrada Familia, yes, that big crazy church, that was all being done from London. In the tech startup industry, this is even more dire because, well, there isn't a tech startup industry in Australia, at least as far as I know when I left in 2017, especially compared to the US, UK, and a lot of mainland Europe. A big reason for that is tied to tall poppy syndrome. And a net effect of that, the country is too risk averse. The country as a whole is incredibly afraid to take on any sort of risk. Risk and investors go hand in hand. And to start a startup, you need support from people willing to take on risks. And next to nobody in Australia is willing to do that. I worked for a travel startup in 2015, where as part of it, I got paid to travel through Europe for 50 days to take photos. An absolute dream job, especially at 21 years old. And the travel startup, which was built on a very good idea was founded and run completely by Australians. They tried for an entire year to get investors in Australia and not a single one was willing to take on the risk. You know who was? A bunch of investors in Finland. So they all moved to Finland. And that's where they were based, on the other side of the world. You know how ridiculous that is? This is the case for so many Australian founders where the venture capital money and willingness to invest just simply isn't there in Australia. And neither is the government support to make things happen. Granted, I left Australia in 2017, so I'm sure there's more now, maybe, but really it's too little, too late. The brain drain is already happening. 
in Australia already has this reputation for being a dead zone for startups. I wouldn't be making this video if I wasn't frustrated about Australia's wasted potential here, but this country could be so much better off if it was just willing to take a little bit more risk. The country is a nanny state. Australia is an extremely safe country. You can put your wallet in your back pocket. Can you believe? But sometimes it can get a little bit too much. There's absolutely no sense of personal responsibility where it feels like you can't be trusted to behave yourself if left to your own devices. When you go to the headlands and cliffs surrounding a beautiful beach like Coogee, you find handrails to prevent you from going too close to the cliff's edge. The same thing when you go to the Sydney Opera House. Heaven forbid you walk up a 35 degree incline, you might die. When someone think of the children? You're not allowed to open carry or drink alcohol in public spaces. It needs to be in a brown paper bag. A couple of governments ago, there was an overzealous religious nut job of a senator who tried to force through a heavy handed internet filter to dictate what we could and couldn't see on the internet. According to his views. And the thing is, I've seen these restrictions get implemented more and more over time. There's no gradual improvement here, there's just more and more and more guardrails. Contrast this to other countries where the rules are more lax and people are given the responsibility and the trust to do the right thing themselves. In Europe, you can drink alcohol in parks or pretty much any public space you want. And you don't see the levels of chaos that you might expect considering the ban in Australia. Because the rules are more lax, people have a more moderate relationship with alcohol. And you don't see the levels of binge drinking that you do here. By here, I mean Australia. I'm not physically there, but you know what I mean. My sense of place is really messed up right now. Of course, with some exceptions, <coughs> England, <coughs> What was that? On the flip side, there are some good things that Australia has done through hard regulation that I agree with. Like the strict regulations, campaigns and rules against smoking. Growing up, I was bombarded by anti-smoking advertising with pictures of gore and lung cancer and black tar coming out of people's lungs. And Australia was a pioneer in that, banning smoking in more and more public spaces, plain packaging laws, jacking up the taxes on cigarettes. And the net effect of that is smoking is essentially taboo in Australia. The air is so clean outside and I love that. But these are regulations on something where the mere act of it has an effect on the people around you, whether they want it or not. The nanny state problem bleeds into the next issue, which is a juicy one and very New South Wales specific, the lockout laws. This was a series of laws that got put into effect in 2014 after an incident where an 18 year old adult got punched in the face, hit his head on the curb and died of his injuries. The media kicked up a massive frenzy about it and the state government knee jerk reacted with a series of laws known as the lockout laws. The lockout laws were this. No shots of any alcohol after midnight, unless if you put a mixer like Coke or something into it, then that's okay. Rule two, you cannot enter any bar or any club after 1.30 a.m. This is the lockout. And rule three, last drinks at 3 a.m. These laws were applied to a city where the whole industry grew up over decades without any of these laws existing. And the whole ecosystem built itself up around that. You had bars that got busy at 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. The after party ones that stay up until eight. You have hotels connected to these bars. And suddenly these heavy handed laws just drop in and completely annihilated the nightlife industry in Sydney. All of it gone completely gone. It was pretty stark for me because I left on my exchange to Montreal in December, 2013, and these laws didn't exist yet. And then I came back in August, 2014, and the nightlife was non-existent. King's Cross, which was the nightlife district of Sydney, no longer exists. Certain parts of Sydney nightlife lasted longer than others, but they fell down eventually as well. These laws were touted as necessary by the state government to keep the people of Sydney safe and save lives. They applied to the whole area of the Sydney city center, the CBD, except the casino, which had a nightclub known as Marquis, which was the most violent venue in Australia. Can, can somebody explain that? to me? That's so interesting. I wonder why the casino and the most dangerous nightclub in Australia was exempted from these rules intended to keep the people of Sydney safe. Is the government corrupt? The answer is yes. Very, very 
corrupt. King's Cross was very conveniently gentrified to hell and the shut nightclubs were promptly turned into apartment blocks by the government's real estate developer mates. It's not like they were expecting anything, they just hopped on an opportunity. And multiple New South Wales premiers from the conservative Liberal Party. In Australia, Liberals are right wing and Labour is left. Don't ask questions, that's just the way it is. We're done in for corruption by our anti-corruption watchdog. There's plenty of info about this if you look it up. Anyway, the premier at the time was this guy named Mike Baird, who was extremely popular, but then became deeply unpopular over this whole thing and got the nickname Casino Mike. They even made a song about him. Won't let me pass, I'm blocked out fast. Empty streets. Everything's illegal. Anyway. <laughs> I and many other people joined protests against these laws organized by Keep Sydney Open. The goal of the protest was to fight against these changes and repeal the lockout laws and they were absolutely massive. 10 to 15,000 people per protest and they were so much fun. Basically just like a moving party with portable DJ sets ending at Hyde Park with the festival stage. It was great, Art vs Science played, Flume was just walking around in support. It was a vibe. Even with these huge numbers, the media completely ignored these protests and tried to throw it all under the rug. This is what we were fighting against as young people in Australia. These corrupt politicians only caring about their housing developer mates, the media completely ignoring everything we say and do and want, no matter how passionate we are and push their own agenda. It's great to grow up in Australia. It's great to raise a family in Australia, but it's terrible to be a young adult in Australia. I love Sydney. It has the potential to be one of the best cities in the world, but it squanders it and keeps going in the wrong direction. And at a certain point, after fighting for what you believe in and probably getting ignored the entire time, you have to take a step back, project your life out and think, okay, I could spend the rest of my 20s fighting for this and getting nowhere, or I can pack my bags, take all the tax money I would have contributed back to this economy and leave and go somewhere where most of this stuff is already figured out. So that's what I did. After a couple of corruption scandals and enough pressure, the lockout laws were repealed in 2021, but honestly, what difference does it make? The damage has been done. The city is dead. Racism and treatment of foreigners. Australia likes to portray itself as multicultural and accepting, but it is such a racist country. My god, I've dealt with it growing up from some really basic bitch bullying in high school to imbeciles yelling it out of their cars as they drive without a license, but it's always minimized by those doing it or those defending it. Oh, it's just in our culture. We're just casually racist. We just make fun of everybody, etc, etc. But you don't. It's so endemic in our society that you almost feel like you have to make jokes about yourself and the fact that you're different just to fit in. My parents are from Sri Lanka, and while my background is Sri Lankan, culturally, I'm Australian. Saying I'm Australian is a more accurate descriptor of who I am as a person than saying I'm Sri Lankan, a country that I've only ever visited and never lived in. We could do a whole video on this topic, but let me just say this. Most of the time when I meet people when I'm abroad and I say I'm Australian, people just accept it. Maybe say my accent is a little different than expected, fair enough and later on maybe ask me about my background. That's fine, it's respectful. But in Australia, the more common response to me saying I'm from Newcastle or from Sydney is, but where are you really from? That classic fucking question. You must have felt really clever asking that question, don't you? Funny how if I was a white person in this colonized country, I wouldn't get any of the same scrutiny. One time I met an Australian abroad and after saying I'm Australian, I got a stern laughing, repeated, no, you're not. No matter what I said to him, it was just, no, you're not Australian. And you wonder why when I moved to London, I deliberately avoided living in Clapham, where all the Australians are. It's isolating because it communicates that no matter what you do, what passport you have, you will never be Australian. This feeds into the treatment of foreigners where they constantly looked down upon, passed on for job interviews, blamed for all of life's problems, and all with this air that Australians are somehow better than them when they did absolutely nothing to earn their passport. Because their parents just happened to give birth on this particular patch of dirt. 
Back in 2016, I co-founded and ran the Exchange Society at my university, the UNSW Exchange Society, which started out of a desire to give exchange students coming to my university as good or better an experience as I did on my exchange in Montreal. Through it, I became friends with a ton of exchange students from all over the world and got a lot of feedback on their experiences with the country. The overwhelming opinion they had after spending six months to a year here was, I had a great time, I am so happy to leave. As a foreigner, it's hard to feel welcome in Australia, especially as a student. International students are seen as nothing but open wallets and pay many multiples more than I did for my degree. One international student pays for one semester, I pay for my entire degree. Even basic concessions that were offered to me, not as an international student, but on exchange in Montreal, like getting concessions on public transport, they don't get that here. They have to pay full price. My views about Australia have done a complete 180 pre and post exchange. Before my exchange and traveling to Europe, I romanticized Australia and thought it was the best country in the world. After seeing how the rest of the world does things and then coming back, all I could see was what was wrong with it. Public transport before, it was great. After, absolute trash. I could go on. But this 180 in perspective comes from another thing about Australia, which can be good or bad. It's a bubble. Australia is incredibly isolated. To give you an example, the whole world could end and annihilate itself in nuclear Armageddon and Australia would be fine. Nobody would remember Australia. And this goes both ways. Growing up in Australia and all its comforts, you enjoy it. And these places like America and France and Egypt and China, seem like far away foreign concepts. You study a foreign language like French in your eight, like me, but think, what's the point of learning this? You wonder why everyone on Sesame Street and American TV shows have such weird accents when you just talk normal. This is a genuine thought that I had as a kid. And then you leave Australia and then you realize, oh, we all have accents. Nobody talks normal. Learning French is actually a useful skill. And there's a whole world out there and you're so, so far away from it. Before I left Australia, and yes, I did travel a little bit before that. I went to Sri Lanka a few times, to New Zealand, to Singapore, to the west coast of the US once on a school trip. We saved up three years for that. The fact that Australia is so far away didn't really occur to me. But after you go on exchange and travel, completely transform who you are as a person and make extremely close friends with people who accept you as that new person, and you're back somewhere where you aren't, Suddenly that distance can become incredibly isolated and hard where it wasn't really before. That's not even mentioning how difficult it makes it to travel from here. Australians have the reputation that we'd love to travel and that we travel a lot. But the reality is, is that when we're all the way out here, we have to make the most of it. When I finished my semester exchange in Montreal, I had three months before my next semester started back home. My mentality was, I'm all the way out here. Why don't I just hop across the Atlantic and do as much of Europe as I can before I head back home? Because who knows when I'm gonna be back. Australia is not just isolated, it's really big. You can hop on a plane from Sydney and be in it for five hours and 50 minutes and still end up in Australia. That's how long it takes to get to Perth. Even New Zealand, which you think would be close, takes over three hours to get to. Singapore? over eight. This makes a whole concept of weekend trips to other countries like you can do so easily in Europe an impossibility in Australia. The most you can do is go to Melbourne. And after enough times, you really have to question why you're going. And this is completely ignoring the price differences. If you love travel, it is so much easier to do it abroad, whether you're in Europe or even Southeast Asia. Since moving to Europe, travel is so accessible, it becomes a normal part of life. It's not as exciting anymore. Maybe that's a part of getting older, but overall, I think that's a good thing. I could go into more detail about all of these reasons, but I'd rather this video have an end. So let me leave you with some closing thoughts. Australia has a lot of great things about it. Great weather, beaches, food, best coffee in the world, good salaries, quality of life, education, healthcare. Out of everywhere I've lived, there really isn't anywhere better to raise a family that I found than Australia. But that's the thing though. I'm grateful that I was brought up there, but I don't regret leaving for a second. If you want a nice, safe, stable, comfortable life, you can get it in Australia, but it's boring. There's a lack of opportunity. It's a nanny state. It's not a country made for young adults. And like me, you could stay and fight like I was during uni, or you could pack your things and leave to somewhere else where most of these problems have been figured out already. Australia feels like a time machine.
it feels like going back 20 or 30 years. If this video gets any traction, I'm sure there's gonna be some Australians in the comments saying they're very tired, generic, and uninspired. If you don't like it, leave. Well, I did leave and I'm so much happier for it. And if you're an Australian who's thinking about leaving, maybe you should join us. Join the brain drain. It's a lot more fun out here and definitely more the place for me. And that's the thing. At the end of the day, I'm sure there's many Australians who've done kind of what I did and moved to other countries, lived abroad, and even with all those experiences, decided and realized Australia is home. And I prefer being in Australia and moving back there after a couple of years. And that's fine you've explored, you've seen what's out there, and you've decided that Australia is the right place for you. For me, I'm the opposite. I went abroad, saw everything, and realized Australia is not the place for me, and I feel more myself and more at home while abroad in other countries. Their perspective is okay, and my perspective is okay. Everybody's different. This whole video is just my opinion and my own lived experience. If you're interested in knowing more opinions for different people, check out the Guardian article that I linked in the description. It's a good read. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'm curious to know your thoughts, especially if you're an Australian yourself who has lived overseas. On this channel, I make videos about my life living abroad, digital nomading and guides on how you can do all of this yourself. So subscribe if you wanna see more of that and let me know what you wanna see next in the comments. Okay, I think I'm done. That was a long video to make. I'm gonna try and make the most of this mildly acceptable London weather as I can for the last time. Thank God. Okay, I'll see you in the next one. LaShawn out.